the structural framework for the functioning of most societies and have a wide range of responsibilities. While there are many types of governments, they are concerned about similar national issues from the economy to education to defense to health. Outside of the government itself, so many other groups influence society. This includes corporations, the media, nonprofits, clinics, lobbying groups, and the people themselves. These groups have a lot of influence, but instead of representing a particular country or state or physical area, they often go beyond borders and represent a set of values or an ideology. As a result, these groups are called non-state actors because they are separate from governments or states. Even though these non-state actors aren't affiliated with, directed by, or funded through the government, they have a lot of power to facilitate change. Keep in mind that a non-state actor in one country may actually be controlled by the government in a different country. However, while non-state actors can be influenced by the government, they still have their own agendas. This can be clearly illustrated through the role played by non-state actors in various social movements. A social movement is when a group of people and or organizations work towards a common goal. This goal is oriented around social change over a long period of time. Often, the social movement doesn't come from within the government, but rather outside of the government, and this is where the non-state actors come in. Unfortunately, things aren't always straightforward. Sometimes the non-state actor involved is working with the social movement to promote change. Other times, the non-state actor is what the people of a particular social movement are demanding action against. We will look at various examples around the world of both of these cases. Sometimes called the ecology movement, the environmental movement has its origins in the response to the industrial revolution of the mid-19th century. Due to increased amounts of air pollution from coal, the urban middle class pressured the government to create environmental laws. The first of them, Britain's Alkali Acts, was passed in 1863. Since then, groups have been forming around a wide range of specific areas within the environmental movement, from wildlife conservation to rural preservation, to anti-nuclear activism to prioritizing sanitation to controlling pesticides. Specifically, in the U.S., the environmental movement took off after World War II, when many environmental disasters alerted people to the consequences of their actions. Today, the environmental movement is still just as diverse. It focuses on issues that have become buzzwords in today's society. This includes global climate change, acid rain, GMOs, ozone depletion, and so on. However, while the efforts of the environmental movement are cemented in various laws enacted by the government, in many ways, the paths to those laws were shaped by non-state actors like NGOs, advocacy groups, and protests organized by ordinary citizens. Let's take a closer look at an example in Ecuador. This case has a long and complex history spanning many countries and decades. It officially starts in 1993 when a group of Ecuadorian citizens filed a class action lawsuit in U.S. federal court against Texaco, an American oil company. A year later, in 1994, a group of Peruvian citizens do the same. Their claim is that Texaco's oil operations between 1964 and 1992, mainly drilling in the Lago Agrio oil field, caused environmental damage in rainforests and rivers and increased health concerns in both Ecuador and Peru. Activists call this incident Amazon Chernobyl. Both of these lawsuits were dismissed in U.S. federal court because the court believed that there was no jurisdiction in the United States. Rather, they believed that this case should have been heard in either Ecuador or Peru. So, in 2003, this case was brought forward in Ecuador. By this time, Texaco had merged with Chevron, an American energy corporation. The Ecuadorian community has also attempted to bring this case before the ICC, the International Criminal Court. Their claim is that because Chevron polluted the rainforests and rivers, and subsequently avoided any form of repayment or remediation, this constituted a crime against humanity. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled in favor of Chevron Corporation, seemingly ending the fight of Ecuadorian villagers and American lawyers seeking repayment from Chevron for huge amounts of pollution. However, it was far from over. They then took the case to Canada. In 2018, the Ontario Court of Appeal upheld the Ontario Supreme Court's ruling, saying that Chevron Canada cannot be held liable for the parent company of Chevron Energy Corporation. 